Let's let's look here. Um, let's start in chapter or chapter four, verse one. Now, or when therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus uh, made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not as uh, not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the gr- parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Let's pray once more, Lord. Thank you for your word. Now, Lord, as we look in it tonight, help us to take it, to hide it in our hearts, to obey it, to apply it. Help us to be not just hearers of your word, but doers as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, of course, you know this story, the story of the the Samaritan lady and Jesus, he goes and sits on the well. The disciples go and they go to find some food. And um, uh, as, he's, uh, as they're going and he's sitting there on the well, uh, the lady of Samaria, Samaria, the Samaritan lady comes, begins to talk to him. He reveals, hey, I'm the Messiah. I'm the one the scripture has talked about. He reveals some things to her about herself. She goes off and tells all the people of the city, hey, listen, I met a man and he told me everything about me, things that nobody else would know. And hey, this is the one. And then she brings back a slew of people. Isn't that good? That's how it ought to be, by the way. When you meet Jesus, you ought to want to tell other people. And, uh, And by the way, not just when you meet him. But on down the road, years and years, you ought to be trying to tell other people about Jesus. That's one of the chief aims of a Christian is to let others know how to be saved. But I want us to look, take our attention and focus it on verse 6 here. The Bible says, Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. I want to talk to you tonight about the weary Savior. That kind of a marvel to me. This is the Son of God. Uh, the king of kings, lord of lords. He, he was there at creation. And yet we see here in his humanity, he actually gets to a point where he's weary. Now listen, the Bible, or Jesus said that all power was given to him. Uh, uh, he could have uh, done anything he wanted to refresh himself and he wouldn't have had to be weary. But we see here <coughs> um, that he, uh, we, we see what power and strength and wisdom we see in, in Jesus as we read the word of God. But here we see a portion of his humanity um, it was uh, in this account we see how truly human the Son of God was. We see him here weary. He needed rest. And to do so, he had to sit down on the well. Now listen, in his humanity, he was worn more so than his disciples. We see as they go there, man, he's weary. He goes and he sits down on the well. Man, I'm tired. I'm worn out, fellas. And the disciples are like, hey, that's fine. You go ahead and rest. We're going to go find us. We're going to go find us some food. And they leave. But listen, he had greater mental strain than they had. Uh, he had weariness that they knew not of. Hey, you know, Jesus knew his purpose. He knew what he was there for. He knew what the end was going to have in whole, uh, store for him. He carried the weight of the world on his shoulders. Man, he was wore out. You know, that mental strain many times is, is more wearisome, isn't it, than that physical strain. Uh, uh, I love helping people and uh, sitting down and letting them tell me uh, their problems and me trying to help guide them through that. But, boy, after doing that, sometimes I feel like I've done manual labor for about six, eight hours. It'll wear you out. Now, I love doing it. And don't say, well, I don't want to wear the preacher out. No, man, I want to help you. I'm just saying that mental strain, that emotional strain, well, you know how it is. That is a a wearisome thing. And here we see Jesus. Uh, uh, He's uh, been under mental strain and exhaustion. He's weary. His self-denials allowed him to relate to us. Have you ever thought about that? He would in all points be made like unto us. Here he is, the Son of God. He had never known weariness. He had never known thirst. He had never known hunger. He had never known pain. He had never known rejection. And yet the Son of God comes to earth. He takes on, the, takes on flesh just like us. And he says, boy, I want to know what they're going through. And he allows himself to be made like us in all points. He, wouldn't keep, uh, he would not keep from himself the feeling of fatigue. And he could have. He was the Son of God. Uh, he would not perform a miracle for his own refreshment. We see Jesus said, or the devil said to him, hey, look, if you're the son of God, take these stones and turn them into bread. And he said, no, no, I'm not going to do that. Man shall not live by bread alone. <clears throat> he would not perform a miracle for his own refreshment. He would refuse to bear, uh, he would not refuse to bear the heat, the thirst, the exhaustion. Here's what I'm saying. Listen, he knows what you're going through too. You, you understand that Jesus has also suffered hunger. You understand that Jesus also suffered thirst? 
Do you understand that, that Jesus also suffered rejection? Do you understand that Jesus also suffered uh, 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 from being weary? He knows what you're going through. Listen, he probably understands it better than you understand it. Do you realize that? That Jesus probably understands what you're going through better than you understand what you're going through. He, he uh, has made himself able to sympathize with us. Hey, to the traveler who rests by the roadside, Jesus knows how he feels. To the laborer who's worn out from his work. You ever come home from work just plumb, as my papa used to say, just tuckered out? Or my papa used to also say, man, I'm worn to a frazzle. Now I have no idea what a frazzle is. But I've been worn, and if a frazzle feels that way, boy, bless a frazzle's heart. I've been worn. I said, boy, I'm worn to a frazzle. I'm worn plumb out. Hey, listen, Jesus knows how you feel. Uh, the sufferer who feels pain. Hey, some of you, bless your heart. You're in constant pain. Think of Brother Jesse, our, our bus director. He's always in pain. And out working a, a public job, and he's always in pain. Boy, he gets on a bus sometimes, and boy, the pain he experiences. Hey, Jesus knows how he feels. He's had that pain. Hey, and not just the physical pain, but that emotional pain. That heartbreak. Man, he knows what it's like to have everybody that he, he loved and trusted in to turn tail and run and leave him alone. He knows what that's like. That poor man who has no place to call home gets his food wherever he can. You know, Jesus can relate to that. That weary-minded one who's oppressed and distressed by the hardships of life and circumstances in the past. Listen, he knows what it's like. And we see our Savior here as, he, as he's traveling. He gets to Samaria. He gets to this well. And the Bible says he's wearied. I believe that meant a body. I believe that meant mentally. I believe that meant in his spirit. Man, he had given out and given out and given out. So he said, fellas, I'm just going to have to sit here. I'm tired. But listen, I think our Savior still weary in some way. In Isaiah chapter 43, verse 24, the Word of God says this. Thou hast bought me no sweet cane with money, neither hast thou filled me with the fat of thy sacrifices, but thou hast made me to serve with thy sins. Thou hast wearied me with thine iniquity. I believe that Jesus is weary now. He's weary with our sins. Hey, the Bible says right here, thou hast made me to serve with thy sins. Thou hast wearied me with thine iniquity. Now look, Jesus said that he would never leave us nor forsake us. Is that right? Is that right? Amen. Hey, he said how, uh, uh, that he would be with us until the end of the world. Is that right? That's exactly right. Hey, when I trusted Christ as my Savior, the Holy Spirit came and took up residence within me, and hey, he's with me. Amen. Am I right? So listen, when I go out and do the things I know that I shouldn't do, do you know that Jesus is with me when I'm doing those things? Hey, you know, when I, I turn on the TV and, and boy, I'm watching it and, and I, I let things come before my eyes. You know, David said, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. But I, I let those things come before my eyes that I know, boy, I shouldn't. Be.
full of that. You know, we just got real tired of it, and I can't tolerate it. You don't need to be doing no arguing. If you can't say something good, don't say nothing at all. Preferably, just don't say nothing at all. I'm tired. I'm weary. Sometimes my boys, boy, they, oh, man. Having five of them, sometimes I think they tag team. Hey, Daddy, can we go do it? No, no, no. They know they shouldn't keep asking, so they, I think they go into, hey, you go ask him now. Hey, Daddy, can we do such and such? No, you, you don't need. Here comes another one. Here comes Carson, them big brown eyes. I love you. Daddy, can we do such and such? Oh, man, I'm tired of you asking me. Go ahead, play in the interstate. Do whatever you want to do. I'm tired of it. He said, here you have wearied me. He says, thou hast made me to serve with thy sins. Thou hast wearied me with thine iniquity. You ever reckon sometimes, child of God, if, if I'm talking to those that are saved right now. You reckon sometimes the Lord Jesus Christ, he looks down and he says, well, I'm just really tired of you doing that. Man, I forgive you. I forgive. And by the way, he'll keep on forgiving. Boy, what a, a mer the Bible says his mercy is everlasting. Praise God. Are you wearing him out? Well, I know I need to stop that line, but it just comes so natural. Well, I know I shouldn't be using that language, but man, I just can't help it. It's part of who I am. Oh, Lord, forgive me. Then a few minutes later, Lord, forgive me again. Lord, forgive me. Lord, this is the last time. Forgive me. Lord, I knew the last time was the last time, but this really is the last. Hey, would you forget? I did it again. We'll begin to justify and make excuses so we can do it more. Are you making him weary? Not only weary, wearied with our sins, but listen to this in Isaiah 114. Here's what God says. Your new moons and your appointed feast, my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I'm weary to bear them. The children of Israel, they would worship God ceremoniously. I mean, the priests did their thing, the singers did their things, the, the instrumentalists did their things, the high priest did his things, but their heart was not in it. It was all a formal worship. And God says, man, with, you draw nigh to me with your mouth, but your heart is far from me. You go through the motions of things. You're doing the ceremony of things, but your heart is not in it. And he says, boy, I'm just really getting tired of that. Don't you think that God probably longs for some true obedience? Don't you think he, he probably says, look, I gave you my word to teach you how to live and, and to guide you and to direct you and to comfort you and to strengthen you. Hey, if you'll just obey it. I'm learning the greatest piece of advice I can give to anybody is this. Just do right. Hey, let the chips fall where they may. Just do right. If the Word of God says it, then do it. If the Word of God says it's wrong, then don't do it. If the Word of God says you should do it, then go ahead and do it. Just obey. Just, just do right. Sometimes I think, oh, son, all I want you to do, just take out the trash. Please, just clean your room. Boy, they're going clean, especially the young ones. Go and clean, and then we'll go and look in there. My wife will go and look, and she'll say, oh, she'll come back. You're going to have to do something. Well, what do you want me to do? Told them to clean their room. Said they not clean it? They said they did, but go look at it. Now you go in there. Looks like a bomb. Don't look around, Lance. You know what I'm talking about. Here's their idea of cleaning the room. Okay, Now, what she'll do, she'll fold the clothes for them because we boys don't know how to fold clothes good. All we know to do is just kind of ball them up, you know. She'll fold the clothes. She'll set it on their bed. Now, here's Lance's idea of cleaning up. When I'm going to bed, instead of just knocking the clothes off on the floor, I take them off the bed and set them neatly in front of my bed. And then if the clothes hampers overflowed, I might shove some dirty ones under the bed so that nobody can see them. 
And if there's any trash on the floor, even though the trash can is full, I'm just going to pile it up. I'm going to put the trash can in a corner so I can use two walls to pile it on up the wall. And you go and look in there and you think, Lord, have mercy. But there's been times I thought for sure a pair of socks was going to come after me and attack me. Those things look like they had life in them. He says, oh, why don't they just listen and do it? Hey, don't you think the Lord feels that way sometimes? Don't you think he says, look, I know you're going through a tough time. Just obey me. Just obey me. Hey, don't you think he longs for some true rejoicing? Don't you think he longs for some? The book of Psalms is filled with verses about singing and rejoicing. Not just the book of Psalms, all through the Bible. Oh, hey, I like this. Oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. We get up here and sing, He's the foundation of my salvation. He is the rock, the solid rock on which I stand. And the congregation says, Hey! Do you think that maybe once in a while God would like to see a heart overfilled with praise for him and see somebody just raise their hand? My, my preacher used to say, hey boy, I tell you what, sometimes my heart, God gets to squeeze in my heart so hard the juice runs out of my eyes. I'd see the tears running out of his eyes. I remember Sidney Suggs, he'd get in the choir. He had been old drunk, and man, God had saved him. He'd get up there, and somebody say the name Jesus, and Mr. Suggs would just break out the crying. I mean blubbering crying. Say, oh, boy, he's been good to me. Hey, don't you think he would like for you just to break out? Hey, you know what? We, we go to church, and we think, okay, here's where we sit down. And here's where we stand up. Here's where we open our book and sing. Here's where Brother Perry uh, sings the, uh, uh, the wrong verse. And here's where... <laughs> I'm just kidding, Brother Perry. No, I'm really not. Uh, that's funny. Uh, and and here's, here's where we pray. And here's where we take the offering. Hey, what if sometime one of you just said, Boy, the Lord... Hey, preacher, could I interrupt for just a minute? I just want to say, the Lord has sure been good to me. I just want to brag on him a minute. Hey, I mean some true rejoicing. I'm talking about, hey, don't you think that God would enjoy some true adoration sometimes? To where we got alone by ourselves. That's the only way you can get alone, by the way, is by yourself. To where you got alone, where nobody can see you, where there's no show to be put on. You just got on your face. Said, God. I sure do love you. Hey, God, you have been so good to this fellow right here. Well, I know that I'm nothing but a, a worthless sinner that you saved by your grace. And God, I just want to thank Hey, God, I'm not here to ask you for anything right now. I just want to tell you how much I love you and how in spite of the circumstances, God, you're still a good God. You're always good. Don't you think he would enjoy hearing that from a sincere heart? Rather, well, I go to church and I stand up and sit down and sing and I do this, that, and the other. Hey, you know, how, hey do you serve him from your heart? He said, boy, I've seen your rituals. I've seen your ceremonies. He said, I'm tired of those things. I'm just tired of them. Boy, I want a, some, some, some sincere worship. I want some sincerity in this. Hey, I think he's wearied with our airings through unbelief. Listen to this in Psalm 95, 10. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation and said it is a people that do err in their heart and they have not known my ways. Man, God would deliver him. And he gave him his word and said, here's what I want you to do. I set before you a blessing and a curse. I set before you life and death. If you obey me and you serve me, here's life. Here's the blessing. If you disobey me and turn away, here's the cursing. Here's death. But they didn't believe it, so they turned away from him. And boy, God had to bring judgment. That brought him back. And he said, look, I'm here. To, I'm ready to forgive you. I'm ready to bless you. But they didn't have faith in him. And they continued to err. Continued to err. It amazes me. People ask for advice. Preacher, what should I do? Give them advice. Say, thank you, preacher. Thank you, preacher. Then they go and do their own thing. And when it falls apart, preacher, what was that you said to do? I didn't think it worked. Hey, listen, get in the Word of God and just do what it says, folks. 
but doesn't seem to be working. Well, the Christian life is nothing to be tried. It is something to be lived. Okay? Well, things aren't going too good for me. Now, I'm going to try something else. No, no, no. Have faith in God. Don't you think? Many times, or all the time, the darkest hour means dawn is just in sight, right? When it's at its darkest, that means the sun's getting ready to start rising again. I believe that many times we give up on God when the victory was just around the corner. Just there, I, hey, if I just held on a little longer, or if I would have just keep serving him, don't you think God says, oh, wait, 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 hey, don't turn now. Don't turn now, you've come this far. Hey, right down, here's the victory. Right down, here's the blessing. Don't turn around now, but through our lack of belief, we err from his way. Don't you think he gets tired of that? Hey, let me ask you something. Are you wearying God? Isaiah 63, 10, but they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he was turned, uh, turned to be their enemy and he fought against them. I believe he's wearied with our resistance of the Holy Spirit of God. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, quench not the Spirit. Here's what that word means, that quench not. Boy, the Spirit, he's on fire. He's eager. Man, we invite, him, we invite Jesus Christ into our hearts. We ask him to save us. We trust Christ as our Savior. The Holy Spirit, Brother Chris, the Holy Spirit comes to live within our hearts. And man, he's eager. He says, boy, I want to mold you. I want to make you to be like Jesus Christ. Hey, he's on fire. He's fired up. We hear the Bible speaks of that unction of the Holy Spirit. Man, he's, hey, boy, I, I want to change you, man. Hey, there's some things in your life I'm going to point out to you. I'm going to clean those things out, and there's some things you need to be doing. All oh, this is going to be great. And then we resist him. We quench him when we resist him. I like to build fires. I'm not very, well, I'm good at building a fire. I'm just not good at controlling it. I, 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 let's see, uh, just a month ago, I caught my wheelbarrow on fire, and uh, I, I, not too long ago, I had the fire Got out of control, was heading to my chicken pen, and I was about to fry chickens, amen, with the feathers still on them. Uh, it's always something. Uh, but I like to build fires. When they start to get out of control, you know what I do? I go get some water. I take over there, and I douse it. You know what? I quench it. Psh, the fire goes out. When we resist the Holy Spirit of God, when, when the preacher preaches, or we're reading the Word of God, or we're praying, and the Holy Spirit begins to say, hey, you know you need to change this. And hey, here's something you know you need to be doing. And hey, boy, you need to yield to this. Here's something, I want to change you. And we say, no, 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 I'm not going to. We resist, we quench his Holy Spirit. Don't you think God says, man, look, I sent that, that part of me, that person of the God had the Holy Spirit. I, I sent the Holy Spirit. He's to be your comforter. I wanted him to comfort you and you wouldn't let him. I sent him to be your guide and your teacher. He's gonna, he was going to guide you into all truth and, and you wouldn't let him. Hey, don't you think that, that he gets tired of it? In my home, I'm the oldest in my home. Not in every area, but in many areas, I got the most sense. Not in every area. My wife has a, a lot of sense too. My boys... I have a lot of sense. Now, they, the older they get, they're gaining more sense. But they've still got a lot to learn, and they'd be foolish, foolish boys to think they have it all figured out. Sometimes I'll be trying to give some advice, and they'll begin talking before I'm done. I can't stand being interrupted. I, I hate it. I hate being interrupted. Please don't interrupt me. All right? Can't stand being interrupted. And then people interrupt and say, I I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Then why did you do it? Sometimes they'll interrupt. They don't mean to. They're not thinking. They're just excited to interrupt. You know, I'll, do, I'll just stop talking. You know why? Because I'm trying. I'd be tired of trying to tell them. Dad, were, were you done? No. <laughs> well, go ahead and finish. Son, I'm 41. I done forgot what I was saying now. Too late. You missed out on some profound wisdom. I think he's wearied, wearied with our rebellion. Yeah, I'm talking to us, child, children of God. Malachi 2.17, ye have wearied the Lord with your words. Yet ye say, wherein have we wearied him? When ye say, every one that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delighteth in them, or where is the God of judgment? 
He said the things that God says are bad, you say are good. The things that God says are good, you say are bad. You've rebelled against God. And I'm just tired of it. The Bible says he sat down on the well, he, being wearied of his journey. I wonder, I, I wonder, now I don't know, I don't know if I have scripture to back this up, but I wonder if sometimes Jesus just says, Phew. oh, I have to sit down. I'm weary. The Bible said all the day long he stretched out his hands to the children of Israel. And then one day he said, I'm weary. I, I got to rest. Do you weary God? Do you weary him? Let's go a little further here. Romans 10, 21. But to Israel he saith all day long have I stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Listen to what he says in Amos chapter 2, verse 13. Behold, I am pressed under you as a cart is pressed that is full of sheep. You know what God said? He said, boy, you're my children. You should be my blessing. I've, I've wanted to bless you and I wanted to give you life and blessing, but now I'm pressed under as a cart uh, uh, that's full of sheaves. In other words, he says, you've become a weight to me. Is God a weight? Are you a weight to God? I keep trying to help them. And man, they, they, look, they keep on. I, I bless them. I forgive them. I show my mercy and all. They just keep on doing what they're doing. Boy, I want to help them. I want to I wanna turn them. And I want to mold them to be more like Christ. But they just won't let me. In Isaiah 7, 13, the prophet asked, and he said, Hear ye now, O house of David, is, is it a small thing for you to weary men? But will you weary my God also? He said, look, you've, you've done things that have caused men to be weary with you, but are you going to actually weary God? Now let me ask you something. You saved, if you saved, you trusted Christ as your Savior. Are you, are you wearying God? Or are you a blessing to Him? Now I'm sure we all weary Him from time to time. I'm known as a general rule. Are you wearying God? Or are you one of those that when God looks down, he says, hey, look at this one here. Boy, he's obeying me. Oh, he failed, but look, he's getting back up. He's dusting himself off. He's not stopping. Look, he's obeying me again. He's yielding to my Holy Spirit. He's letting my Holy Spirit to, oh, look, he fell again. Oh, but look, he's getting back up. Just a just man falls seven times and rises up again, amen. And hey, he's getting back up, praise God. Don't only look at our weary Savior, but I want to look at our waiting Savior. When he was weary and he sat on the well, he didn't just sit there to get rest. He was waiting on somebody. Hey, he waits for comers to the well. He waits for the most sinful. This lady had had five husbands. The one she was living with now was not her husband. He was waiting on her. Hey, he knew she had come. He knew, hey, here's, there's a sinner going to be coming. And boy, I'll get my strength. That's why Jesus said, I have meat to eat that you know not of. To his disciples, they said, somebody been feeding him. He said, my meat is to do the will of God. In other words, that's what's going to give me my strength again to tell a sinner how to be saved and to tell somebody how to live for God. Hey, that's going to give me my strength again. Hey, did you know he, he waits for you? He waits to convince you. He waits to convert you. He waits to enlighten you. He waits to accept you. He waited for the disciples. They went to get bread. They too needed to be given understanding. They came and said, hey, what are you doing talking to the Samaritan lady? He began to say, hey, hey, I want you to look out here. This lady's coming. She's bringing, notice, she's bringing all these men. They've got their turbans on. He can see down the crest of the hill. There's these white turbans bouncing up and down. He said, hey, fellas, look, the fields are white already unto harvest. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest that he had sent forth laborers into the harvest. He's saying, hey, fellas, we need to tell somebody about Christ. They too needed to be sent. He said, hey, if you'll come to me, come to me. I'll make you fishers of men. They too needed to learn of the Lord's priorities. Hey, let me ask you this. How long has he waited for you? Now, number one, I'm talking about salvation. Aren't you tired of trying to make it without Christ? Let me ask you, how far is that getting you? Aren't you tired of making it without him? 
Well, pastor, I go to church, and pastor, I've done this, that. No, look, the only way to get to heaven, there's got to be a time in your life where you realize, man, I'm a sinner on my way to hell. I need a Savior. And at that time, with all your heart, you call on the Lord Jesus Christ, asking him to save your soul. And when you trust Jesus and only Jesus, listen, he'll save you. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord might be saved. Is that what it says? No, it says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Hey, if you're sitting here tonight, and you've never asked Jesus Christ to save your soul, he's waiting on you. He's waiting on you. He's waiting on you to strengthen you, too. Some of you in here carry some heavy burdens. Aren't you tired of trying to carry them on your own? Aren't you tired of saying, boy, I can can handle this myself, and you just make things worse. Hey, and I found that we do this a lot of times. We say, okay, Jesus, here's my burden. I'm laying it at your feet. We lay it there for about two hours and say, boy, things aren't going the way I I think I need to pick them back up again. He says, look, I'm waiting. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Hey, he's waiting to strengthen you. You know why some of you can't find strength in the Christian life? Because you don't go to him. Did you realize that just coming to church is not all you need? You need a personal, daily walk with Christ yourself. That's where you get strength. Hey, the Bible, this is your meal. This is your meat. This is your sustenance. This right here will give you strength. He's waiting on you. He's waiting to give you understanding. You ever got to that part in your life where you think, boy, I don't understand. I don't know what to do. I don't have a clue what to do. You know, the Bible says that he'll give understanding. But here's the key. You've got to go to him. He's waiting on you. How long has he been waiting? He's waiting to give you direction. I don't know which way to turn, preacher. What do I do? You go to Jesus. I know that it was Dr. Lee Robertson. Man, preached for many, many years. Just died, uh, what, about two years ago, I guess. He used to preach a sermon, and he'd say, it takes three to thrive. He'd talk about going to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. But then if somebody needed his counsel, he'd say, listen, uh, if you don't go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, then there's no need to even come get my counsel. He said, because you're not doing your best. He said, if you just come, that'll solve a lot of your problems. Just come and hear what I'm saying from the pulpit. If you're not willing to obey that, then you're not going to listen to me anyways. Hey, he says, listen, if you'll just come to me, I'll give you direction. I'll tell you, I'll help you understand the decisions you need to make. He's waiting to comfort you, too. You just go to him. I remember as a little boy, I went to bed, and my imagination began to run wild. I can't remember what triggered it. I don't know if somebody had passed away or what. I began to think about this thing of death. I was about a six- or seven-year-old boy. I began to think of this thing of death, and I thought, man, what if my mama died? What if my daddy died? What if my papa or mama dies? Boy, after a while, I began to cry, thinking about what am I going to do if these people die? I was a little boy. I didn't understand it all. I got out of bed, and I walked down the hallway. My mom was sitting across the room in a little recliner. She wasn't reclined, but she was sitting there in that chair, that brown leather chair, and, uh, and I was just crying. She said, Honey, come in. You know what I did? I took off the running. And I jumped up in Mama's lap. She put her arms around me. Boy, I can still remember it, although I was only six or seven years old. My Mama, she began to come. What's wrong? Honey? I began to tell her. She'd say, Honey, it's going to be okay. She began to explain to me salvation and Jesus and heaven and those things. And boy, how it comforted my heart. I remember when I was about an 11 or 12-year-old boy, me and my dad went outside, went out back to fly a kite, and he stood up near the driveway, and we had a, a, a pretty long backyard. It wasn't extremely wide, but it was a long one. He held the string on his fingers, uh, that spool of string, and I got the kite, and he said, now start running backwards. Well, I don't know if you realize, when you run backwards, you can't see where you're going. Down at the base of my yard, we had a basketball goal. It was mounted on a, about a four-inch steel pipe that stuck up out of the ground way up high. And I got to running. Daddy wasn't paying attention. He's just saying, keep going, keep going. And I didn't see that pole because it was behind me. And all of a sudden I went, dong, fell on my face. 
You know how when your foot goes to sleep, it feels like needles are in it? My whole body felt that way. Man, the grass felt like razors. My, my hair felt like porcupine quills. And I thought, this is it. I'm dying. I'm going to be paralyzed. This is terrible. I began to shake. My dad came down there, and here's all he did. He put his hand on the back of my head. He said, you okay, boy? You know what? Just my daddy putting his hand on my head. What a comfort that was. Jesus says, look, I know you're carrying a heavy load. I carried one too. He says, I know you're hurting. I know your heart is broken. I, I know that you've been rejected. And Hey, look, I've been there too. I've suffered that way. Come here, boy. Come here, girl. Come, please come up close to me. He says that he, he longs to gather us under his arm as a chicken gathers her chicks under her wings. Here's the thing. He's waiting on you. It's your move. The Bible says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. And here's the thing. He made the first step when he sent his son, Jesus Christ. Now it's up to you to make the next step. And boy, if you'll take a step closer to him, he'll come closer to you. He'll say, I made a step. You take a step, take a step closer. And for every step closer I get, I actually get two steps closer because he comes close to me. He's waiting for you. Now let me ask you this. Will you yield to him? Hey, let me ask you, church. Are you weary of your sinful way? No, I'm enjoying mine. Hey, listen, let me tell you something. You're going to be weary. Psalm 38, 3. There is no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger, neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. Aren't you tired of doing things your own way? Aren't you tired of trying to make it on your own? Aren't you tired of trying to, to work it out yourself? Hey, listen, Jesus says, come to me. It's obvious that this Samaritan lady was weary. Man, she accepted. She went to tell others. Let me ask you, do you weary God with your life and how you're doing? Do you weary God with your attitude, with your spirit? Do you weary God with your sin? Do you weary him with your rebellion? Do you weary him with how you resist his Holy Spirit? And number two, are you weary? Because if you are, he's waiting. If you've never been saved, man, he's waiting for you to come. He said, just come to me. Just trust me and I'll save you. But most of all, I'm talking to the saved tonight. If, you, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, he's waiting there for you. Come on, I want to help you with your problem. I want to encourage you. I want to strengthen you. I want to comfort you. But you got to come to me. Everybody, bow your head and close your eyes, please, if you would. Let me ask.